Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Aniagoro. Coming up in the next hour, 2020 was supposed to be the year the guns would fall silent in Africa, part of the African Union's campaign to achieve a conflict-free continent, prevent genocide, make peace a reality, and rid the continent of wars, violent extremism, human rights violations, and humanitarian disasters. But that dream has turned into a nightmare as the number of insecurity hotspots across the continent continues to grow and various efforts in search of peace and security fall dramatically short. We'll review security in Africa in 2019 and assess areas of concern in 2020 in a moment. So, yet another attack in Kenya's northeastern border with Somalia and growing insecurity in the Sahel, as well as Nigeria, Cameroon, South Sudan, Central African Republic, DR Congo, Libya, and the list goes on. The deadly consequences of violent conflict are there for all to see across Africa, crime, terrorism, and the proliferation of small arms exacerbated by the existence of large swathes of ungoverned spaces that leave room for illegal activities, helped of course by persistent corruption, poor governance and bad leadership. Terrorist organizations such as Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, IS in the Sahel, Boko Haram and Iswap in Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin continue to destabilize the region costing the continent billions of dollars and creating some of the biggest humanitarian crises in the world. Throughout 2019, the continent seemed to be stuck in permanent crisis mode. So will it be any different in 2020? Well, the African Union has set itself an ambitious target of silencing the guns in 2020. Take a listen. So based on uh, the flagship project of silencing the guns pursuant to Agenda 2063, the Peace and Security Council developed a roadmap for silencing the guns in Africa. So uh, while the roadmap uh, recognizes that the drivers uh, of uh, crime and of terrorism and conflict in Africa have varied, the use of small arms has been a common characteristic amongst all of them. Another common characteristic and casualty is that of Africa's development. Conflicts escalate, fueled by the availability of weaponry and undermine our quest for peace and security. The biggest challenge we have in the continent is really uh, peace and security. Silencing the guns is not only the responsibility of Africa in Commission, it is also the responsibility of each and every country in our continent. It is also a, a strong signal outside the continent those who are still pouring more armaments in this, in this continent and trying to militarize it. We hopefully get the understanding of everybody that enough is enough when uh, it comes to uh, bringing more armaments in the continent. The African leaders have come to realize that very little of their ambitious project for Africa could be actually accomplished if they don't succeed in silencing the guns. All this conflict between Somalia, in South Sudan, uh, in Libya, in the Central African Republic, they reflect uh, deficiencies in uh, governance. They reflect the problem which we have in Africa of uh, uh, managing diversity. If we can address these factors and find durable solutions, we'll be able to go on a steady path towards silencing the guns. Well, to help us review security in Africa in 2019 and to look ahead to 2020, let's speak now to two top-notch security and defense analysts. First, David Otto joins us from our London studios and later in the program will be joined here in Abuja by Dr. Kabiru 
Adamu. And let's go straight away to London. David, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, from your vantage point as a seasoned defence and security analyst, does the AU's plan of silencing the guns in 2020 seem more like a slogan than a programme? Uh, thank you, Charles. I think from my perspective, I think uh, uh, it's always good to have a plan, and, and uh, that's quite encouraging to have a plan, uh, which, of course, this was set up uh, in 2013 uh, by the EU uh, to silence the guns, you know, from 2020. Uh, but I think, you know, as you rightly said, you know, this sounds to me more like a slogan uh, because, you know, the mechanisms um, that needs to be put in place in order to silence the guns is yet to be fully established or even established at all. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the five corners of Africa, you know, um, talking about uh, North Africa, for example, you look at the situation in Libya, it's, uh, uh, it's more chaotic than it was in 2011 when it all began. If you look at uh, East Africa, as you rightly mentioned, um, there are critical security issues in, in Sudan, uh, South Sudan, Somalia. Um, you know, you have countries like uh, Kenya, Mozambique, you know, suffering from uh, terrorist organizations, including, um, you know, Al-Shabaab. You know, if you go to Central Africa Republic itself as a country or as a region, you've got a crisis uh, between Ambazonia, uh, defense forces and, and the government of Cameroon. You also have Boko Haram, you know, within that same region. Uh, which spreads across Niger, Chad, you know, but most importantly in, in Nigeria, which then leads you to the west uh, of Africa. Uh, so it, it gives me that impression uh, that that region, you know, is critical because, you know, you have Al-Qaeda in, in, in the west, in African province, you know, uh, by the Arbanawi faction, you still have the old Boko Haram, you know, still lingering about. You have the, the crisis, the headsman crisis in the central part of Nigeria. You still have the unsolved problems in, in the northeast and uh, the south, south, southwest regions. So that area hasn't actually achieved anything. And then you, you talk about Central Africa going back to DRC, uh, Cameroon, Niger, the Luptako Goma region, Charles, you know, has been, uh, you know, um, you know uh, crowded by Al Qaeda and ISIS jihadists in Mali, daily attacks in uh, uh, in Burkina Faso, in, in, in areas uh, like um, Niger, you know, again, as I mentioned, Chad. So look at the global picture, the African global picture, I, I, I mean to say, uh, from the central to the east, uh, to the west, you know, to the south, um, with uh, South Africa with xenophobia, which I, f I forgot to mention. It tells you that this audacious plan, uh, even though it looks good on paper, you know, hasn't actually um, you know, had any substantial, you know, if I want to use that word, substantial uh, way forward plan. You know, I, I don't think uh, the guns will be silenced uh, come this 2020. I think what has happened generally is that the African Union is getting more silenced, you know, than the guns that it intends to silence, Charles. Well, that's very interesting, uh, David, and thank you very much indeed for setting it all out there in very clear, lucid language for us. With me in the studio here in Abuja is another very well-respected security and defense analyst, Dr. Kabiru Adamu. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. You heard David Otto in London there. Would it be fair to say that the biggest challenge to realizing the aspirations of people in Africa is conflict and insecurity? Um, I agree totally. Um, like David has, has painted, virtually everywhere in Africa, uh, you look at there is one form of conflict, uh, insecurity, um, and there are trends that I would say uh, have defined those conflicts and insecurity. Uh, one of them is weak um, government, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, virtually all the states where you have those levels of insecurity are characterized by very weak um, governance structures. And so inherent in that you have imagined, um, you know, indi indicators of insecurity that unfortunately because of the very nature of that governance is unable to tackle. Mm. And then if you now move to the regional level, because um, most of um, 
the parts of Africa, depending on what, where you go to, West Africa, there are regional arrangements, some of them political or, and, or economic. They have, over time, attempted to come together and um, seek to address these issues. Um, inherent in that, too, is the inability to implement some of the decisions that they, they, they've taken. So um, it, it's an unfortunate cycle that we've seen over time, and that is, um, uh, as it were, blossoming. Um, leading to the same issues of insecurity that, uh, you know, it's, mm. it's wor worrisome. And um, the quality of life is being affected. Uh, of course, people are dying. Properties are being destroyed. Uh, I mean, there is no way good governance can even take place in such mm. an em environment. So it's an unfortunate cycle uh, that appears quite um, bleak. Well, we will um, take a look at the humanitarian consequences of all this later in the program. But David Otto in London, do you agree with that assessment that conflict is one of the biggest impediments to the implementation of any development agenda in Africa and tops the list ahead of poverty, unemployment and even corruption? Uh, I, of course, I do agree. Um, uh, the, the question sometimes is which comes first? Is it the conflict that comes first or is it poverty that comes first? Uh, the, the African Union had prob you know, properly diagnosed uh, that uh, conflict was the biggest, uh, if not the, the top most uh, serious problem that Africa faces. You can't have any form of development you know, with uh, you know, a conflict ridden state. Um, so I think what the African Union really needs to do, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to, is to, <laughs> rather than look at Africa as a generic uh, country, is to encourage each and every one of its member states, because mind you, the African Union is clearly made up of member states. Each and every one of its member states needs to look at its particular dynamics and, and develop a structure that would en enable them to deal with these issues of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis, you know, their economic ambitions. Um, that is the only way that the African Union can, can clearly you know, achieve what it set out to achieve. Um, you, know, you don't achieve uh, an African uh, silencing of guns 2020 when you don't encourage individual member states to build resilience. So I think um, uh, this is quite important. But let's not forget uh, the external impact that Africa is going to face you know, in 2020, one of which is the influx of, of foreign fighters you know, that have come from the collapse of the Islamic State. We've seen them uh, embolden the, uh, the conflict situation in Africa. So I think that's quite important. But also, Charles, the, the issue of climate change. Uh, the deterioration of climate change began, uh, you know... Um, okay, I'm really sorry, Africa, David, but I'm going, to, I'm going to have to interrupt you there, David. Um, just please hold that thought. We'll come straight back to you, but we've got to take a break. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our review of security in Africa in 2019 and assess areas of concern in 2020. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anya Golden. Now, earlier this month, the United Nations envoy for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohammed Ibn Chambers, said the region is experiencing a devastating surge in terrorist attacks. Mr. Chambers told the UN Security Council that attacks on civilian and military targets have increased fivefold in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger in the last three years. In recent incidents, uh, dozens have been killed and wounded in attacks on military bases across the region with civilians caught in the crossfire. And there have been fierce clashes between security forces in the Sahel and in Nigeria and jihadist militants. Dozens of IS fighters have been attacking the northeast Nigerian state of Borno accessing military bases by posing as soldiers. The militants have also laid siege and shelters for displaced people, making their lives even more vulnerable. Here is the UN envoy for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohammed Ibn Chambers, briefing the UN Security Council earlier this month about security in the region. With the thirst for vengeance. The West Africa and Sahel region has been shaken by unprecedented terrorist violence in recent months. As I emphasized during my briefing to the Security Council on 16 December 2019, 
Relentless attacks on civilian and military targets have shaken public confidence. In Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, casualties from terrorist attacks have increased fivefold since 2016, with over 4,000 deaths reported in 2019 alone as compared to an estimated 770 deaths in 2016. Most significantly, the geographic focus of terrorist attacks have shifted eastward from Burkina Faso to, from Mali to Burkina Faso, Niger, and is increasingly threatening West African coastal states. The number of people killed in Burkina Faso has increased from 80 in 2016 to over 1,800 in 2019. The number of displaced persons has also increased, and indeed in this case tenfold, to about half a million, in addition to 25,000 who have sought refuge in neighboring countries. The terrorist attacks are also often deliberate efforts by violent extremists to capture weapons and trafficking routes and engage in other illicit activities, including illegal artisanal mining in certain areas that sustain their networks. Mr. President, distinguished members of council, terrorism, organized crime, and intercommunal violence are often intertwined. This is especially true in peripheral areas where the state's presence is weak. In those places, extremists provide safety and protection to populations, as well as social services in exchange for loyalty. The UN envoy for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohammed Ibn Chambers there. And with me, two internationally respected security and defense analysts. David Otto is in our London studios. And with me here in our Abuja studios, Dr. Kabiru Adamu. And let me come straight back to you, David, because you were talking, giving the reasons why things were getting, appear to be getting worse. So you were talking about the influx of foreign fighters and the impact of climate change. Yes, Charles, uh, the, the, uh, the influx of foreign fighters has created a high level of uh, uh, further insecurity within the region because you have now experienced uh, jihadist fighters flocking in high numbers, you know, through porous borders into Africa. And what this has, you know, increasingly done with the experience talking to people just recently from coming back from Africa is that the people are feeling increasingly that the simple social contract that the people expect in terms of protection from both national and international organization has been eroded. So the ordinary African, you know, in most countries that have these jihadist activities don't feel protected and they feel that their rights are being violated. So that social contract which is required for a government to function is no longer there. And that is a key issue, Charles, because there is no trust and there is an increasing level of fear amongst Africans because of this level of insecurity. And what that is you know, driving into is putting more people into uh, the arms of jihadist organizations and other criminal organizations. So that is the kind of picture which you know, Africa needs to avoid come 2020, but it requires a strategic uh, uh, plan and outlook on this. Okay, we'll talk about those strategic plans in a minute, but uh, Dr. Uh, Kabiru Adamu there, um, talking about social contracts that David was mentioning there, what appears to be happening here is that conflict has become the inheritance of many young people in many parts of Africa, and the legacy that is being passed on to them is the burden of conflict, and that is problematic. It is problematic, because... That's, that's the culture that they would know. Um, if if um, a society has the benefit of comparing um, you know, a good time, as it were, when uh, governance, uh, as it were, and the social contract that mm. we're discussing exist, um, then perhaps it would have the hope of getting out. But when um, the conflict is so pervasive, 
and that the culture has been em ingrained as it were within the society and youths um, know the only way they know is to mm. embrace that, that culture to survive as it were then unfortunately I think uh, where it's a cycle that it's bound to continue mm. um, part of the well danger as it were in all of this is that man by his nature would seek ways to survive and um, so you would have as the case is in Nigeria, um, emergence of non-state actors that are involved in governance. Now, the rules that would uh, guide their involvement in governance is non non-existent, as it were. So they pick up arms um, and seek to protect whatever communities mm. uh, they belong to, and in doing that, ostracize whoever is not part of that community. Community, maybe the visitor is, um, you know, he has migrated from one part to another, and so you see the conflict um, mm. beginning all over again. A cycle, as a you cycle, say. Um, unfortunately. It's quite extraordinary, David. Um, against that backdrop, I mean, we've clearly outlined the problems, the issues, uh, the continuing. Um, fights and attacks and conflict and so on. I mean, how much progress would you say was made in Africa in 2019 in the quest for peace and security? Because there were lots of security meetings and frameworks and plans. How much fruit did those initiatives bear in 2019? I think one of the significant uh, progresses, if you may put it this way, is that there has been a lot of condemnation um, from the African Union when crises happen in, in several areas. Um, Cameroon, for example, you know, has been a significant area where um, the crisis keeps deteriorating. And what the African Union has simply done is to, is to condemn issues. Uh, the Sahel region, the Luchako Goma region, Burkina Faso and all these regions, again, there's just been condemnation. So the, the level of progress you know, has been one step forward and two steps backward. So I think what needs to really be um, the, the key here is that um, the, the, the aim of the, of the silence in the guns was to avoid uh, the future younger generation to carry the bug of you know, uh, finding security in Africa or stabilization. But I think uh, clearly from, you know, the insignificant um, uh, progress, which, you know, if, you, if, you, if, if there is any progress at all in the security domain, uh, it clearly indicates to me that the future generation has to be able to prepare itself uh, to take over the button and create some level of stability in Africa. What uh, one would have expected, you know, was to see individual African countries, um, you know, develop a, a a well-established effective strategy but my experience you know going to Africa and talking to African leaders and uh, civil society and, and all stakeholders is that there is this interdependence uh, you know or what I call the high dependence on uh, Africa's security being given to outsiders you know a lot of African countries you know still uh, rely on the West you know to provide its security whenever you talk to them about capacity building you know, the next question is, you know, who is going to fund this? So I think the moment African countries realize that there is no economic development without stability and security in the 21st century, then we would have some progress. Right now, I think, you know, it's just motion without movement. Okay, well, let, let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Kabiru Adamu, because we're looking at progress. The problem, of course, is that while progress has been made over the last two decades or so, and the guns have fallen silent in previous hotspots such as Angola, Ivory Coast, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, conflict has exploded in places like Libya, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, the DR Congo, the Lake Chad Basin, parts of Nigeria and Cameroon, the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. So lots of new threats there. Exactly. And I think, um, the f just, just to build on what David has, has mentioned, the fact that in, when, we, when you talk of the Sahel, uh, perhaps the greatest trigger of the conflict um, violence in the Sahel is Libya. Mm. And currently, the initiatives we're seeing are not African-driven. Uh, the first one was Russian driven with Turkey and then recently the EU, Germany had in, had in that. Um, I would, one would have expected African countries seeing that the impact is death 
they are feeling the impact more. They probably understand the cultural dynamics mm. um, involved uh, to play uh, the lead role in terms of mediating in that conflict. And of course, uh, by doing that, solving their own challenges. And um, part of uh, our, as it were, disappointment is even regional um, you know, uh, leaders unfortunately have reclined. Uh, a good example is West Africa. The role Nigeria used to play uh, in the past in you know, galvanizing West African countries to stem um, th this type of um, violence. Unfortunately, uh, Nigeria no longer plays that. Um, if you look at perhaps Kenya mm. and the role it played in Somali and all that, that too has declined. I suppose they're, 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 they're having to deal with their own conflicts exactly. and that's taking a lot of their attention. But, but stay with us. We, this is a very interesting discussion. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our review of security in Africa in 2019 and assess areas of concern in 2020. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now, a large population in Burkina Faso has been forced to flee its home. There have been attacks just this week by violent Islamist extremists. Burkina Faso is in the epicenter of this jihadist crisis that has not only engulfed the country, but large parts of the Sahel as well, including Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Chad. Just over a year ago, there were 60,000 people displaced by violence in Burkina Faso. Today, it's more than 600,000, according to the Norwegian Refugee Council. So a tenfold increase in the number of people displaced by violence in one year. Now, that is truly extraordinary and unparalleled anywhere in the world. We'll talk about all that in a moment. But first, here's the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council, Jan Egeland, who's been visiting Burkina Faso, speaking from one of the displacement camps in the north of the country. So we're now in Barsaloga in northern Burkina Faso, which is the epicenter of the fastest growing humanitarian emergency in the world today. There were 60,000 people displaced last January. This January, there are more than 600,000 displaced by horrific violence. We are overwhelmed as humanitarians. We are able to put up tents that are now overcrowded. We are providing some water, but that is too little. There is not enough resources to provide even the minimum that these people need. At the same time, we have to recognize that there is no protection for people outside of the camp. They, they are afraid even in the camp at night because there were attacks close by uh, uh, in the last few days. So what we saw when we came to the camp was that people were uh, fleeing along the roads to the provincial capital, Kaya. They have given up hope in this northern region of Burkina Faso. So the world needs to wake up. There needs to be protection and a much bigger humanitarian uh, assistance to the people here. Jan Egeland there, and with me, two globally acknowledged security and defence analysts. David Otto is in our London studios, and with me here in our Abuja studios, Dr. Kabiru Adamu. And to you, David, as you pointed out earlier, the humanitarian disaster that Africa faces is not just from wars and conflict, it's also from climate displacement. Of course, um, uh, climate uh, change, you know, has affected, you know, Africa seriously, especially when you talk about the Lake Chad Basin and, and the Sahel, uh, where conflicts, you know, have emanated from uh, local farmers and, and, and cattle rearers. Uh, you know, um, in, in Nigeria, we've seen that, in, in Mali. And, and these conflicts, you know, somehow lead, uh, you know, people that believe they can't be protected. Uh, by the national security to, you know, uh, do a self-help, you know, by uh, either carrying weapons themselves, which they can readily find in, in the black market, or enlisting themselves uh, into uh, local jihadist organizations, uh, 
where they uh, then pay them and you know get the protection. So th there is this issue which uh, you know needs to be resolved. But of course, as you know, these are long-term uh, strategies that are required, you know, to deal with the climate change issues. And you know, governments need to really take that into uh, uh, proactive action and make sure that uh, climate change does not impact. On, on the security situation, and on the other hand, is this, this, the conflict themselves impacting on, on climate change? So I, I think you've got to look at it from from those from both sides, and, and understand that the initiatives in Africa must focus a lot on on, on these anti-terrorism um, uh, 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 issues, which you know then lead to other bigger crises. So th this is a big issue, uh, Charles, and I hope that African governments can can really. Uh, look at the issue of climate change and, and wars, especially within the Sahel and the Lake Chad, and, and see how they can really um, uh, you know, claw back you know, some of this impact that it has as we speak. And, and, and uh, Dr. Kabiru Adamu, just looking at this withering humanitarian crisis across Africa, I mean, in addition to things like climate change, uh, natural disasters and so on, You've got um, South Sudan, Congo, Lake Chad, Cameroon, Nigeria, etc., all conflict-induced, or at least partly, perhaps majorly conflict-induced. Yeah, are you referring to the humanitarian, mm, the humanitarian. Ch ch challenge? Y yes, um, you know, it's, it's well documented. Um, and of course, the UN uh, has several released statements um, in showing clearly mm. the impact of um, the conflict, as it were, on the humanitarian um, the challenge or disaster in uh, pa parts of Africa, including, of course, um, Nigeria. Um, part of a, one of the most disturbing, I think, developments is where it appears uh, the humanitarian community and the governments in the con these countries, unfortunately, are uh, not working together. There seems to be um, some form of disagreement between them on what constitutes humanitarian support. Mm. So uh, there is a clear need for humanitarian assistance, and then those that are giving the humanitarian as assistance are unfortunately not getting the cooperation of the government. And tied to that, I think it's this um, perhaps long-held belief that humanitarian agencies have some elements of espionage um, mm. links. They've got their uh, own agenda. Agenda, e exactly. So that has also crept into Africa. Uh, in Nigeria, as an example, you hear the narrative by the humanitarian com communi community that the space is increasingly being um, constricted. Um, just over the weekend, uh, an international non-governmental organization has it had its offices shut down in mm. Borno, and the reason was um, there is a procedure for movement of goods from the capital into the hinterland, and allegedly that organization did not follow that procedure. Um, I mean, in all of this, uh, while we are not um, blind to the fact that the military itself is also sometimes involved in humanitarian assistance mm. because in most times it is the first humanitarian agency to arrive locations that are uh, sometimes riddled by, by conflict. But where you have this great need, um, just as has been de depicted by the video you showed mm. um, in Burkina Faso, um, and then you have agencies coming in to assist, and then they are not getting the right support from the home government. It's, it paints a really, really um, gloomy picture. So I think that's cr uh, very important. Um, multilateral agencies, such as the UN, that provide platform for discussions of such issues, where these countries are members, need to take this issue seriously and emphasize the importance of humanitarian a assistance and as much as possible find a way to do away with this uh, lack of trust and confidence that leads to uh, the kind of blockages that we've seen. That's a very good point. And David, I mean, you're, you're there in Europe. Uh, you're talking to us from our studios in London. What is the perception there about what the stumbling blocks are uh, to the smooth mounting of uh, humanitarian assistance in Africa? I think it's all about uh, uh, management, uh, Charles. Uh, of course, when this humanitarian crisis uh, happen as a result of war or as a result of climate change, um, then you, you're looking at how the uh, 
the, the country that it happens within, for example, in Nigeria or Niger or, or Mali or any of the countries in, in Somalia, uh, how, do they, how do they deal with it? Yeah. And you know, that is a significant uh, issue that you know, has been experienced. Uh, most people that are displaced as a result of climate change are then you know, made to be further victims you know, when they move from one area to another because the receiving community is not um, uh, you know, much more, it's not giving a, a greater awareness as to um, what these people are going through. So it becomes a, a matter of, uh, of, uh, of a tough war where you know, uh, local communities believe that they don't have sufficient resources for themselves and, and then they have these other people coming into their communities. So I think the issue of management of humanitarian crisis, but also predicting how these uh, crises have impact on, on receiving communities and how they further generate to conflict is quite important. And that is where uh, you know, the African Union should be looking at sponsoring uh, very um, you know, critical research areas to look at how these things can be you know, tackled you know, proactively, uh, but also reactively, of course, when, when it does occur. So I think there needs to be a very clear plan of action. Um, and that can only be done if the African Union takes charge um, rather than you know, somehow uh, allowing other international organizations that you know, actually mean well, but you know, have very little experience in terms of the, uh, the cultural dynamics of what is happening in the continent. So I think if the African Union takes that pivotal role and plays the role of you know, the African overseer, as he's supposed to do, then you know, the humanitarian crisis would be well managed. But again, you know, it requires a comprehensive national strategy for crisis management of that nature. And, and we've seen that backfire in Nigeria and other countries. But I hope that 2020 may give us a, a leeway to see how these countries can deal with it. Well, one of the interesting points made there, Dr. Adam, who, uh, that David made, I think, uh, previously, is the fact that when you look at places, I think maybe you made that point, places like Libya, for example, that you're not having that, it's, it's, you're not, we're not looking at African solutions to problems in Libya, but I suppose the perception internationally and with a lot of countries perhaps in that region is that the conflict was induced in the first place by international intervention. Th that's the perception out there. Um, of course uh, it was felt that whatever um, intervention um, the international um, partners did they would follow up and ensure some form of stability but that wasn't what mm. happened and um, of course it, 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 you know it's quite ironic actually that all ha um, Gaddafi happened, and I mean the reasons are based on where you, your what perspective you you have on the issue. It happened, but then um, how many years after the country is still in turmoil? Mm. There's almost a civil war going going on in the country, and the effect is being felt in across in the in continent in, in, in the subregion, as it were. Um, most of the weapons that we're seeing in the hands of you know jihadists, um, bandits, mm. um, name them. Uh, com most of it is coming from me. Le well, I, I want to talk about that when we come back, because all these things, as you correctly pointed out, terrorism, transnational crime, communal conflicts between herders and farmers, you know, violent urban crime, cattle rustling, they're all being fueled by the proliferation of firearms, which have become the weapons of choice, replacing traditional and less deadly weapons. We're going to talk about that when we come back. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead as we continue our review of security in Africa in 2019 and assess areas of concern in 2020. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Onyegolu. Silencing the guns by 2020. That was the proclaimed goal of the African Union back in 2016, a goal which many experts believe is unattainable, especially if illegal arms continue to flourish. Around 40 million unregistered small weapons are currently in circulation on the continent. Everything from large lorry loads of arms to petty weapons smuggled by individuals may it across porous borders. According to the UN, the trade can often be traced back to criminal networks 
corrupt officials and even returning members of peacekeeping missions. The cross-border trade has raised grave concerns in Nigeria, where more than a million small and light weapons are estimated to currently be in circulation, according to figures published by the Office of Nigeria's National Security Advisor. In an effort to curb the illegal trade of goods, the Nigerian government closed its borders with Cameroon, Benin and Niger, although some observers believe the move was partly prompted by economic motives. And with me, two international security and defense analysts. David Otto is in our London studios. And with me here in Abuja, Dr. Kabiru Adamu. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. To you, David, according to the Geneva-based Research Center Small Arms Survey, civilians, including rebel groups and militias, hold more than 40 million small arms and light weapons, while government related entities hold fewer than 11 million in Africa. Do we know where these guns are coming from and who the top arms suppliers to Africa are? Looks like uh, David's vanished for a minute there. Uh, we've kind of lost him, but we'll try and get him back as soon as possible. So let me put that question to you, uh, Doctor. Okay, David is back. Let's listen in to what uh, he's saying. Germany. Uh, France, uh, the UK, uh, have been mentioned. Have all been mentioned as you know some of the key countries that uh, supply arms. Of course, uh, about 22 African countries also manufacture small arms, but the majority of these arms are coming from outside Africa. So I think it's important uh, to understand uh, that you know we cannot apply the Hollywood model where you buy more guns and you know buy more you know, warships or, you know, uh, fighter jets, and, and then you kill the bad guy, and, and then all the problems are resolved. So I think it's quite important to, you know, to have that uh, understanding that it, it won't work that way. If you can hear me, um, nod if you can hear me, please. <laughs> nope, I don't think you, can you hear me, David? there from that cut in communication but we'll try and resolve that and get back to him as soon as possible but um, Dr. Kabir Adamu is with me in the studio of course African countries also in addition to the places that David mentioned we missed a bit of that uh, African countries also manufacture various kinds of small arms and light weapons and and these are also and they're also of course homemade a, a, a sort of homemade weapons production industry, isn't that? Exactly. So the channels and the sources of um, small arms and light weapons in Africa are both international and, and local, as, as it were. Um, uh, you've mentioned the local manufacturing you know, sources, mm. but the one that I think is more concerning, which unfortunately is not well um, documented, is the armory of um, government um, security agencies. Mm. Either corrupt members of the um, state um, security departments selling them or you know yes, sometimes I read about that. hiring them out yep. uh, for illegal purposes or in some instances as it happened recently in Niger and of course in Nigeria where you see the terrorist um, raiding uh, you know mm. military formations and other security uh, formations and then taking over their armory and you know cutting away the ones they're interested in and then of course touching the ones that they're, they're, not, they're not interested in. Um, and of course by doing that, increasing the number of you know, uh, weapons in, uh, in mm. their disposal. So the sources are there and unfortunately they're increasing by the day. Um, a recent study by um, a German-based uh, organization uh, showed clearly the correlation between the increase in this um, small arms and light weapons proliferation in Africa and then the illicit um, fun funds that are uh, be coming in, mm. in into Africa. Criminal networks uh, who want to support the flow of these illicit funds unfortunately control these networks and so they arm um, groups uh, sometimes through all of some of the channels that we've mentioned mm. uh, from Europe, uh, from Asia, as it were, and then of course through local uh, manufacturing sources so that right. they can control those networks and in the process, um, you know, a continuation of the kind of conflicts and insecurity challenges that um, are inherent in Africa.
And, and uh, David, I presume you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah, we, we lost you for a minute there. Um, and of course, of all these weapons that we've talked about that proliferate across Africa, the AK-47 remains the most dangerous killing tool on the continent, from what I read, causing more deaths, apparently, than bombs, grenades or mines. Yes, uh, of course, uh, Charles, the AK-47 has become the uh, weapon of choice uh, because it's quite easy to, uh, to operate. It's quite easy to cause uh, a huge amount of casualty. Uh, it's not as expensive as other sophisticated weapons. So it's, uh, it's a weapon of choice for most organized crime groups and, and terrorist organizations. And, you know, of course, uh, uh, African governments, you know, and non-state groups have spent and continue to spend millions to buy these AK-47s. So it, it has become the weapon of choice. Um, again, as uh, uh, my colleague uh, Kebi Adamu said, uh, there are, uh, the, the way these jihadists and these criminal groups get these weapons is quite interesting uh, for, uh, for research because uh, one of the things that we've seen recently, uh, not just in the Luktaku Guma region of Sahel, but also in Nigeria, is that the uh, jihadist organizations have become more armed and they are now cutting away weapons uh, from you know, these uh, armed forces and, and then you know, increasing uh, their sophistication. So it, it tells you that, um, yes, you have this uh, uh, increase in, in, in proliferation of arms from neighboring countries, um, that African governments are spending lots and lots of money buying arms, uh, because again, as I mentioned earlier, there is this misconception uh, that, you know, the more arms you buy, uh, the, the more you would solve the problem of terrorism. But, you know, of course, it is not the case uh, because you've got to deal with the reasons why people take up arms in the first place before you, you, um, you look at the, um, the issue of counterterrorism, which is countering uh, the, the taking up of arms. So I, I think the, the, the focus for the African Union, if it will realize its silencing of the guns, is to deal with the issues why people take up arms rather than you know trying to um, you know curtail of course you know simultaneously uh, curtailing you know the proliferation of arms but uh, you know Charles the, the 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 porous borders you know that African countries have at the moment you know gives me little hope that without solving the problems of the borders we would be able to stop the influx of arms from organized crime organizations groups. Okay, uh, Dr. Kabiru Adamu, let's look at the months ahead. Is there anything you see, any signs at all that 2020 will be more peaceful and less insecure than 2019? Um, I would love to tell you yes, but unfortunately the prognosis that doesn't um, indicate that uh, the challenges unfortunately are increasing. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation we agreed that it's a uh, political uh, most of the causes are political. Um, governance, unfortunately, is not improving in Africa, uh, except if um, political leaders tell themselves they start truth and seek ways to improve governance, um, reduce poverty, tackle illiteracy, the unemployment rate, and then, of course, the issues around climate change that we've mentioned, right. which, which we're not hearing that at, at the moment. Um, so unless if there's a conscious effort to address these root causes, um, it's not very likely that we'll see an improvement in 2020. Okay, Dr. Kabiru Adamu and David Otto in London, both uh, internationally recognized security and defense analysts. Thank you very much indeed to the two of you. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and London. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.